Okay, the recording has started. Welcome, thanks for coming. <coughs> thanks for watching online or whatever. Thanks for existing. Um, so last time I showed you that non-orientable objects cannot be embedded into R3. What I didn't say is whether they can be embedded in R4. Um, and actually they can. So on this slide, which I encourage you not to read, uh, except for the remark, um, so the little remark here, is essentially what is written is a map, uh, a coordinate map that embeds a projective plane, which is also written in coordinates into R4. And what I will do today, and that's really the, really the main point, we will see that, ev that it can't get worse. So everything is somehow built out of projective planes. So in eventually everything will embed into R4. Let me reiterate that topology is essentially coordinate-free mathematics, so I encourage you not to look at the top part of the picture, but eventually I kind of need to convince at least you or myself or whatever that uh, we can embed things in R4. So R4 is as bad as, as it gets, so every surface at least lives in R4, and if you can make it into R3, then it's actually orientable, which is kind of a nice statement. But we are not there yet, and the main point for today, and maybe the main point of the whole lecture, will be the classification of surfaces, which is a really, really cool theorem. So I hope to convince you that it's actually good. And this is just a side remark, which I forgot to mention last time. So keep that in mind. Orientable R3, non-orientable R4, and please never write down any coordinate maps not in topology, so what I've done here is actually, philosophically speaking, not what I should have done. Anyway, um, my point is that I would like to have an operation, which I'm going to explain in a second, that is called connected sum, and I would like to think of it as being, a, well, name suggests already, uh, addition on surfaces. So addition takes usually numbers and spits out a number, but now my connected sum here will take surfaces and will spit out a surface. And that's always good because you can always, well, kind of build new things from old ones. That's something you always should be able to do. And this is the operation which will get us there. And that's all we need. So this kind of this operation gives us everything we ever want to know about surfaces in some sense, of course. There will be a very explicit theorem uh, roughly at the end of the lecture, right? So the point is we want to build new things out of old. And what we do is the following operation. So, uh, by, for historical reasons, the, the direct side, the connected sum is denoted by the hash symbol, whatever, so it's a hash. S hash T is a new surface, and ha S hash T arises as follows. So in the first step, I cut some little disks into my surfaces, and okay, so fine, I cut a little disk into S, and I cut a little disk into, so I poke a hole into my surface S and T, and then I can, well, it's a hole, it's a hole on both sides, what, we, what can we do? We can connect, uh, we can identify them, which is the same as saying we draw, oops, we draw a cylinder between them. And as you can see now, we get a new surface that's connected by a cylinder. So what is the operation? I said again, you poke holes into S and T, you identify the holes and by drawing a cylinder between them, and you get what, what is called the connected sum, which is the same, uh, a new surface usually denoted or always denoted by the hash symbol. So H, a, S hash T is this surface, well, for S being whatever and T being whatever. Kind of a really, kind of a really bizarre operation, but it actually does everything we, we actually want. So, say it again, very important. You poke holes into your surfaces and you connect them along the holes uh, using uh, a cylinder. We'll show you zillions of examples. This whole lecture is, is about this connected sum and one million examples of connected sums. So the first one maybe we want to do is something like what is S2 hash S2? Well, let's have a look how this works. Well, I poke holes into them. I draw a cylinder between them, okay? And that's a new surface, but I can do actually better, right? So if you think about this part here, just this little beast, is it uh, a sphere with a hole, right? It just has a little hole somewhere. Now I can pull the hole open if you want. Make it bigger, pick my fingers inside and make it bigger. So that's actually just a disc, a filled disc. 
And well, we have a cylinder now with a filled disk, so you can just pull it in again, have the animation in a second, and what you actually get is the following. So we continue, we make, the, we make it into a little disk, we shrink it, uh, we pull it in, and actually it didn't change anything. So S2, hash S2 is S2. That's kind of really strange uh, sometimes uh, if you think about numbers or something. But there's one number that actually can do the same trick. So 0 plus 0 is 0. And indeed, S2 is the unit, oper uh, the, the unit under this connected sum operation. Right? So why is it the unit? Well, notice that this, in this diagrammatic um, argument, I never really used what's going on on this side. I could have drawn anything, essentially. I only used the right-hand side. So this, the same trick works actually for any surface T. So for any surface T, you have T hash S2 is T. Right? I never touch the left-hand side, run the same argument, you shrink it, you pull it in, and that's it. So it's really the unit under this operation. It's like the zero uh, for addition, what is the zero for addition here, it's, it's S2. And let me stress again, no, I sound like a broken record, but let me stress again, this, this will, it's really the same calculation. I never touch the left-hand side, never ever, but only kind of locally around the DS. Oh yeah, that's what I said already. So very important. It's, it's like the zero, right? So like the zero in uh, numbers, zero plus zero, zero plus a is a. So it's now the same. A hash S2 is a, just written with a T, because well. Okay, so, S2, so S, S2, the sphere, that's, that's already a good start somehow. The sphere is kind of the easiest surface we can imagine. And it is the unit under this operation. It's already a good justification for the operation in general, I guess. Okay, here's another one. Really, this is mostly a, a really beautiful real, uh, visualization exercise, what the things do. So what is D2, D2? So on the right-hand side, you see a disk. On the left-hand side, you see a disk. And now you poke a hole into them, connect them with a the cylinder, and note that, again, I won't touch this side, and this side here, roughly this part, is now just uh, a disk with a hole. So I can pull the hole, again, point, put my finger inside and stretch it out. So essentially, it's just nothing. So it's just a little circle. And if I pull this in, what you will see here is the following. So if you pull this in, it's still hollow. So this is still hollow here, because that's exactly the trick I've done here before, taking my disk with a hole and make the hole very, very big. So that is essentially just a circle. So it's hollow. So you just push it in. Just push the cylinder in, and what you actually get is you now have added a little, so you just poked it, you just have added a little uh, uh, open disk to DS, ah, the other one, sorry, not to DS, to, to D2 on the other side. Okay, so we know what it is, we can describe it a little bit nicer. So this is an annulus, uh, just a strange form, strange, right? I just do it a little bit different, and we see that this is actually an annulus. So D, hash D is an annulus, but the real point is what I made here. Um, okay, it turns out to be an annulus, but the real point is it's whatever you've seen before with a little extra, I, I will call those little things punctures. It's like I poke my finger into the surface and now it's open. So I added a little puncture to my surface. And notice again, I know I sound like a broken record, but actually, the f exa exactly the same calculation, I never touched this side at all, shows that whatever, whatever on the, is on the left-hand side, hashing with D2 always puts an extra hole in your surface. It always puts a, a puncture in, in T. Okay, so hashing with S2 does nothing. Hashing with D2 pokes holes into both punctures. is a mathematically precise name, but it just pokes holes into your surfaces. Well, that's kind of, kind of already quite nice. So let's, um, and I can do the same. I can iterate, right? I can iterate addition, so I can iterate the process. And what this does is it pokes D holes into, into my surface. Right, so if I start with, with some T, and I do the hash operation D whatever three times, I would end up with three little holes in, in my T. You can do this arbitrary often. So D is just some 
um, natural number, and it actually coincides in this case then. If, if t is closed, it will count the number of uh, boundary cycles of uh, t. So we add all of these little boundary cycles to t by hashing with t2, which is pretty cool. So um, here's a mathematically precise operation that can add a boundary to your, so boundary cycles to your uh, given surface. No, it's not so bad. It's actually quite nice. Right, keep in mind that this is, this is my symbol here. So this really just means, well, so ignore the T. This really just means that I put D boundary cycles in whatever I would like to hash it with. The number D will play an important role. So remember, D is the bound number of boundary cycles. Cool, so let's hash some other surfaces we know. What about T? Well, T does the following. It just adds, well, it's just, you just, it doesn't, you, you can't say anything more about it. It just shrinks it together and you get uh, the double torus, right? You just pull it together along the cylinder and you get the double torus. So you can reiterate this process, get the triple torus or whatever, the n torus. So the next number I would like to stress here is n. Just putting a lot of those little handles. Um, I will call this beast here a handle, putting those little handles. It looks like a handle, right? So put those little handles to a given surface. And again, it doesn't really matter what this one is. You could just place any, anything here. And it would just be adding more and more and more of those to your, to your given surface. And that's the next number I would like to stress, the little n here. So n is the number of handles, the number of tori I've added in this operation to my given fixed surface. Mm -hmm. That's already very interesting. So we have seen those guys before, by the way, if you wonder. So let me just do this for you. So this is, of course, the torus. Remember, this was A, A in opposite directions. And maybe I have a different color for you, a B, B. And if you want to think of those as curves on the torus, here it is. So here's a triple torus. And again, if you want to think of them as curves of the torus. But essentially, it's just as a, uh, as a polygon. So here is the torus. This little beast here, right? It has an AABB configuration. Uh, there's a CCDD configuration. Here's another one. And here's another one with EF and so on. So it's really just so those very, very simple polygons. You just have tori, 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 all glued together in this, this fashion. And the, the hash operation does exactly gluing. And we'll see that in a second, or maybe not in a second, but something like five minutes. The hash operation will do exactly like this gluing operation from the square to a higher, uh, higher rectangle here. A higher rectangle, yeah, sure. A higher polygon um, like this. So these are the, the, the n tori. And you can imagine now that it goes up to n. So note the torus is a square. The two torus is a, a six gun. The three torus is an eight gun. The four torus will be a, a 10 gun and, and so on. Uh, did I miscount? Uh, maybe I did. Um, it's actually um, a 12 gun, and the next one will be a 16 gun. Okay, cool. So I'll just show you some examples. And now, I really would like to think of it as being a, a sum on surfaces, right? a set of surfaces. You have an operation called the hash, and it spits out a new surface. So what you would do is, if you do this in whatever kind of abstractly, you want to verify some properties of multiplication or of addition, um, for example, commutativity or associativity. So uh, let's see um, all of these properties. The first one is a little bit subtle. So actually, I need to verify that this is actually independent of where I poke my surface. Otherwise, this operation wouldn't be really well defined. So I should make sure that this is independent. But actually, it's not so hard to see. So um, you could just move it around. It just doesn't change anything. So this is essentially the proof that it's independent doesn't change anything. I just move the cylinder around on the surface. And because they are very far away, in some sense anyway, it doesn't, doesn't matter what I do. So you can really poke it everywhere. It doesn't change anything. The cylinder is kind of the addition. And you can only, it's, it's a very local argument. You only see locally the, the holes, and it doesn't matter what the rest of the surface is doing. Completely local uh, operation. Yeah, then it matters, but everything here is connected. I don't care about disconnected surfaces. If I classify connected surfaces, I can classify disconnected surfaces. 
everything is connected. Right. If I would have many of them, then I would need to decide where to poke, obviously, otherwise it would change. Okay, here everything is connected. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, and let's look, have a look at this one. So S hash T is the same as T S hash. Um, since everything is abstract, it's really, really simple, really, really simple and beautiful argument. <laughs> it's essentially just whether I draw it from the left or whether I draw it from the right. It actually doesn't matter at all. Uh, it doesn't live anywhere anyway. So I just swap the two sides of the operation and the, the surface doesn't care. The surface doesn't change at all. Right? I just swap them. Um, and that shows that S hash T is the same as T S hash. So it looks very much like an addition. It's commutative. Now the first one was very fine that it's kind of well defined. The second one is very fine that it's commutative. That's pretty cool. Actually, so it has a unit, no sphere. It's commutative operation. Um, and it's also associative. And again, the proof is not very hard if I just draw the pictures. Uh, so I have surface S, T, and U now. And it, it's really just if I do this up, no, I did it the other way around, of course. If I do this operation first, or I do this operation first, as you can just see, the, the surface doesn't change at all. It, it doesn't matter because everything is a local operation. The surface doesn't care. So this is also an associative operation. So it's really like, it's really like an addition um, on surfaces. The hash. Some people call it a multiplication, but um, let's think of it as an addition. Um, it's a bit of a matter of taste. Of course, you can also think of it as a multiplication. But it's one of the standard operations you know from numbers just for surfaces, which is actually pretty cool. There's one catch, so you can't cancel a surface. So if you have uh, something like S hash T, and we'll see that equals uh, S prime hash T, that does not imply that S equals S prime. Okay, so this is the real difference to, we'll see examples of this. This is a real difference to, so careful, to, to numbers. Right? So you just can't cancel it. So there's no inverse surface if you want. There's no negative surface in general. Yeah. But otherwise, I would really like to think of you to think of it as an addition, or if you prefer, a uh, multiplication. Cool. And this is absolutely great. This operation is great. It behaves very easy, nicely with respect to the Euler characteristic, for example. So um, it's almost perfect. S hash t, all our characteristic is almost all our characteristic s plus all our characteristic t. It's just a, a little offset here, um, minus two, and you will see in a second whether minus, well, I, I prove it for you, it's not very hard, and we will actually see where the minus two really comes from. Uh, so the minus two makes sure that the sphere is the unit, because the sphere is, of course, of all our characteristic two. So for this equation to work out, and you just get s again, um, the order character, uh, the, the beta has to be a minus two factor. But otherwise, this is pretty cool. I mean, the order characteristic behaves essentially perfectly with respect to the connected sum. And the proof is not very hard, so I essentially just do the following. That was too quick. I replace um, everything by some polygon decomposition. So these are just the two holes. There's an A, there's a B, there's a Z. There's an A, there's a B, there's a Z. They're identified at both sides. We do the count. Uh, I see three edges and three vertices, I guess. So the left-hand side has an one removed face. Well, because it's just poked here. So I do this operation, three minus three plus one, which gives me a <laughs> stupid a minus one here and a minus one extra here, which is, collects into the minus two. So the three is, of course, just cancel. And this is a minus one here. So this guy is a minus one, this guy is a minus one. And those two together give my minus two. And that's where the minus two comes from. Okay, but uh, the theorem is pretty cool, right? So that all our characteristic behaves essentially perfectly with respect to um, uh, hash sum. So that's pretty good because in the end we want to hash everything, and we can just compute the Euler characteristic essentially by from this formula if we know the Euler characteristic of the basic piece. Um, to show you some examples now. So let's do that actually together. So the, the minus two comes from exactly cutting out the two disks here. Right? This is the minus two here. 
OK. Ooh. So this is exactly the constellation I had. So S, uh, some surface, I guess it was T before. S is the same as S hash S2. And so what should happen here is the order characteristic should be, we want a silly equation, order characteristic of S is order characteristic of S. And for this to work out with respect to this formula, yeah, I better have this consolation here, let those two cancel perfectly. So the minus two gets rid of the, the two from the Euler characteristic of uh, the sphere. And that's pretty cool. So if you want to compute Euler characteristic from annulus, you can use the, uh, the D2 hash D2, do the calculation. Um, one plus one minus two is, I guess, zero. If you want to calculate the Euler characteristic of the, the tori, you just do the calculation because you know all the characteristics of all tori. Yeah? So these guys are always zero, 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 zero. So in every operation, you pick up a minus two factor. So it's, let's say you do it two times, a triple torus, you get a minus four. If you do it four times, you get a minus six, and so on. It's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool way to, very, very simple, right? You just, just keep, just remind, remember the minus two factor. Otherwise, you just add the numbers that you already know. I mean, this is a pretty, pretty cool operation. I hope that makes some sense. So let's have a look at how this works on the polygon decomposition instead of on the surfaces, because it's also pretty cool on the, on the polygon decomposition. So here are two tori, if I haven't uh, messed up. There are two tori. And how does it work, the connected sum of the torus? Well, it does exactly the following. It adds an extra edge. The extra edge is the boundary circle where we want to glue it together. Yeah. So and we just do that, and we get this picture glued together. And it's exactly what I showed you before, right? Those little, those little boxes of the tori. So here's my tori one, and here's my tori two. My torus, torus. And you can imagine now doing this five million and twelve times, and you get exactly the polygon decomposition of the n torus that I had on one of the previous slides. Let's do this again. So we add a boundary cycle, add a free edge, E. We identify along E, and it gives exactly the, uh, the bottom picture. Yeah, so it's a pretty cool operation. Um, let's do this one on the polygon decomposition. Projective plane is always a bit nasty, but we need to do it eventually. Um, so here you go, it's two projective planes. Projective plane, the AA operation. Well, you glue them together. And what you actually get is this picture. So really just the boundary cycle in the middle is again this boundary cycle. And the AA and the BB are exactly this. Right? Hope that makes some sense. So the green one is actually this one here cut it out. And it gets identified on the polygon. So you just do exactly the same. And the AA, BB. Uh, note that it's very, very simple actually. The result is very simple. It's just AA, BB. And if you do this now 5 million and 12 times, what you get is also pretty simple. So this is AABB, as I said. Um, so if you do it three times, you get an AABBCC. Just doing the same again. You do it four times, I guess you get, I guess you get the pattern now. You get the AABBCCDD, and so on, and so on, and so on. So as a polygon, this is, don't try to imagine the surface, the, full, the full hatch of P2. And it's very complicated to imagine, but as a polygon decomposition, it's very, very simple. Right? So it's just A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, E, E, whatever, depending on how many, uh, well, depending on how often you repeat the operation. Again, this kind of shows how powerful, actually, the polygon decomposition is, because this, this is certainly a very complicated object to imagine. I, I don't even dare to try to draw it. It's, it's very complicated. It lives in four-dimensional space and horrible, but the... Uh, the polygon is actually not so bad. It's almost the simplest polygon you can imagine. Everywhere. Essentially, yes, yeah. And you get slightly different decompositions. But this is the easiest one, so that's why I would call it eventually a standard form. Yes. Right? Eventually, we need to decide what, what the best form to represent the surface is, because there are many ways to represent the same surface. Yes, right. And this is really simple. Okay. Yeah, so whenever I draw a polygon, I should stress that again, there's a choice involved what I do. There are many polygon decompositions of the same surface. For example, you can try to, we'll solve that eventually, if we could try to wonder what this surface actually is here. Okay, it's triple, it's double hash of, of P2, but we have seen it actually before. It's one of our standard surfaces. 
very different decomposition of a standard surface that, that we are used to. Cool. So let's do disk disk together. Um, this should just add a add a hole. You do the same cutting. You cut it along. Um, you glue it together, and you get this picture. So this was probably too quick. Uh, doesn't really matter. It's some combinatorics you do on the pictures. So uh, I'm running badly on time, so let me just move on. So of course the slides are online. So it takes a while of staring into it, but every step is actually really simple. That's the whole point. So it's really, really simple. And there are two basic operations that we will use. Let me just go to the two basic operations. It's this adding or removing an arch. It's like pointing inwards, putting it open. So that's adding a sphere. And it's the one we have seen before, like cutting it somewhere and actually having two uh, different polygon decompositions. And I call this cutting and gluing, the bottom one, and the top one adding and removing. And what is absolutely not obvious is that is, these are all relations, uh, all operations we ever need. This will produce everything we ever want. And that's absolutely uh, not obvious. So the only thing you ever need to remember is the operation of putting an extra edge into the surface and break it open at that point. That's uh, this operation here. Or to cut the surface somewhere and making it two, 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 two polygon components. That's this operation here. And of course, they go in both directions. Okay, so you can always remove those AA pairs, for example, uh, from a surface. Okay, let's try this one. Um, I call it a lemma because it's kind of important. So the Möbius strip, remember what the Möbius strip is, is actually a punctured projective plane. Right? Hashing D2 to something puts a puncture into it. It's a punctured projective plane. Um, again, the proof is some polygon combinatorics. Uh, you cut it in the middle. Uh, you shift it around. The only thing I did is I shifted it around. Um, and you get this picture, which is the projective plane, so the DD with an extra free edge. If this is too quick, it doesn't really matter. There's some polygon combinatorics going on that is quite easy to verify if you just take your time and just sit down and do it, which is the whole point of this operation. Essentially, it is very, very simple in, in its nature. Also on um, uh, those polygon decompositions. So a Möbius strip is a punctured projective plane. In essence, this, this means a projective plane. It's a, very, it's a very complicated object somehow, but it turns up just everywhere because essentially a Möbius strip is the first example of a non-orientable surface. And remember that I defined non-orientable surface by containing a Möbius strip. So this shows that every non-orientable surface can actually be obtained from some hash operation on the projective plane. So this projective plane plays a huge role. Um, sadly, it's very complicated. The polygon is very easy, right? So keep in mind what the polygon is. It's just the AA or DD in this case. The polygon is very easy. As a surface, it's quite tricky to imagine. Okay, here's another one. Uh, so kind of funny, so uh, the, the K actually, the Clyde bottle is the projective plane hashed with itself. So this one here that I let you wonder about, where was it, come on, here, this one is actually the Clyde bottle. Uh, twice hash, a very different uh, presentation of the Clyde bottle, but it is the Clyde bottle. So we'll see that now. Blah, 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 come on. And it's again kind of exactly the same combinatorics. You can cut the Klein bottle, shift it around a bit, and then you break it apart into uh, two projective planes with AA and CC, which is exactly uh, the projective planes. So the Klein bottle, for example, arises as a hash from the projective plane. So the projective plane is the easier version although the Klein bottle is easier to imagine, in some sense, a projective plane is actually, actually easier here. 
And I have another one for you, and then I can state the main theorem. And this one is really strange. So if you try to do this on surfaces, it gets, so, so not on uh, polygons, I'm doing it on polygons, and that's pretty hard to imagine. But if you hash a projective plane to a torus, or you hash it to a Klein bottle, it gives you actually the same surface. So very, very strange. So sometimes this gets very, very strange. But on the polygon, it's not so bad. So let's have a look. This is very strange. Please remember this is very strange. And by the way, so here is now an example that I can't just cancel the projective plane because the torus is not the Klein bottle. Right. So it still can happen that this appears here. Okay, so polygon, I just put the polygons on, um, and that's what it is. And again, I recommend to just open the file and just stay on it for a while. It's not so hard. But due to time reasons, I just move on. Um, so there's some polygon combinatorics who does the trick. And really, so uh, if you're really up for it, Try to understand the polygon proof and try to do it on the surfaces. On the surfaces, ah, so good luck on the surfaces. So it's really, really hard on the surfaces. Again, shows you how powerful actually uh, the polygons are. Okay, um, and I would like to go to um, to the following, and this is then almost the main theorem of everything. So. I would like to find a, a very simple hands-on, a really, really simple way to decide whether a polygon corresponds to an orientable surface or not. Okay, so what is the difference between those two? Well, okay, one has more edges, but the crucial difference here is that one of them has edges going in the same directions that have a glue. So it's an A and A, they go in the same direction, and the other one has only, right, so if I have an A in this direction, I have an A in this direction, I have a B in this direction, and I have a B in this direction. In particular, if I just start reading from here, like reading clockwise around my, um, my, my polygon, I would write A, I would write B, but inverted, right? I'm going around, I would B inverted, I go A inverted, and I go B. And I call these, these guys that are paired like this, I call them kind of the normal paired edges, Let's do the same for the projective plane. So we start somewhere, we walk around. Whoop. So I write A and A, and now they are paired. And it's the same orientation versus uh, different orientations, and I will call those the unorientable edges. So you walk along the polygon, you write down um, just the word, basically, you get from walking around the polygon by keeping track of the orientation. Orientation is very important, and whenever something hits with A and A oppositely oriented, that's a good paired edge, and whenever I hit some with A and A same orientation, so here I could also write, doesn't matter, I would write, read the other way around, as long as I have the same orientation. I could have read the other way around. Then I call it a non-orientable edge. And the statement is, which I'm going to show, prove in a second if you want, that a polygon is unorientable, corresponds to a non-orientable surface, if and only if you find one of those, at least, at least one of those non-orientable uh, edges. So you just lo look around the polygon, you just walk around the polygon and just look at the orientation of the edges, and that's all you need to do, which is a really easy way to detect whether something is orientable or not. Um, compared to what we've seen yesterday, it looked quite hard to do it, but this is a really, really simple way. Just walk around and check whether edges go in the same direction or not. And, and that's, that's it. Nothing fancy going on here. Really just walk around. So I call these oriented. So if I walk around and I read A, and then A inverse, or A opposite direction, I call them oriented. And I call those guys unoriented. So here I read B and B. And my uh, order of Walking around doesn't matter. So if I walk like this, then I read A inverse and A, still an oriented edge. If I walk like this, then I read B, B, and it's still an unoriented pair. So the, the composition, one has a bar the, in, in this orientation sense, the other don't, is oriented, and if both have no bar or both have a bar, it will be the unoriented case. It's very simple. You have a really huge polygon, you just need to check whether it's it has one of those unoriented edges. 
very, very simple. And let me just do the cut here. So why did I want this strange definition of unorientable with it as a Mobius strip? Well, now it comes on very handy, because if I just do this cut here inside of my surface, I have somewhere a BB pair, I actually get a Mobius strip. So this is now, if you want the proof of my statement that you just need to look for those pairs of unoriented edges, right? So this is just a Mobius strip. So these are the, the, the boundaries of the Mobius strip, and here's our, our little twist for the Mobius strip. So every surface with, a, with an unoriented pair has a Mobius strip inside. There can be many, but remember we only had a zero or one question. We only care whether there's one or not. Very easy check. Just read along the surface, look for orientations. That's it. That's, that's pretty simple. Okay. And now we have the main statement. That's all we need to know to classify, identify surfaces. Okay, so here's the statement. So every surface, well, there's a connectivity assumption, but we discussed that uh, before. So if I know it for connected components, I just know everything anyway. I just check per connected component. So that's not really an assumption. Um, so there exist those D, what's the number of boundary circles. Uh, T, oh, it was N before, that's very bad. Uh, T is the number of tori, and uh, P is the number of projective planes, and every surface is a hash of those easy surfaces. Every surface is a hash of a D, D times, a P, P times, and a T, T times. And it is orientable if it only if, P is zero, and D counts the number of boundary components. And even better, if I do this trick, I have this ambiguity that the projective plane kind of doesn't care what you throw at it. It always uh, kind of doesn't care. In order to get rid of this ambiguity, I have this extra statement, which I will call a standard form. Namely, under the assumption that P times T is zero, the triple uniquely determines the surface. Okay. So this is a really good statement. Just, just let it rest for a second. So we started off by trying to think about surfaces. And it looked pretty complicated. There were projective planes, which you can't really imagine, and way more complicated surfaces than this. And this is a really, really simple statement. There are three numbers that determine every surface. A D, a P, and a T. And P actually is only a 0 or 1. Right? So P, you can choose P to be 0 or 1. So this number of projective planes. Right, this is a really fantastic statement. Say it again, this is really, really fantastic. This is the main theorem of actually uh, the whole lecture. We can this is a classification of surfaces, and they're classified by triples of numbers. I mean, it can't be uh, much better, actually. So this is also by far the longest proof. Um, so it is typed in the file, but definitely I'm running completely out of time. So I'm skipping the whole proof, and I recommend to, to read it. So it's really long. We can click through it. So it goes on and on and on. It's a huge case-by-case -case check. It goes on and on and on. Let me see whether I can find the end of the proof. Each step is not so hard. It's just combinatorics on polygons. But um, it takes you a while to get there. Should be uh, still ongoing. Good. So here we are. So I just skipped the proof. The theorem is amazing, but I'm just really out of time. So I skipped the proof. It's in the file if you want to have a look. It's by far the most complicated proof which I didn't discuss, but anyway. Um, okay, so this is the corollary of it because we had a classification, but what I would rather want to go into, so you just really need to look for this pair, and uh, I know I, I have done this before, but let me do it again. So here's a Mobius strip. So whenever you have this, you've got a Mobius strip inside, and whenever you find something without a, without a projective plane, um, it embeds into R3. Why does it embed into R3? Because it's just made, you look at the ingredients, it's just made out of objects that embed into R3. So this is an if and only if again. Well, pretty good. So uh, we can always, if you have an unoriented pair, you find a Mobius strip. If you don't have an unoriented pair, so there's no projective plane, you get this decomposition and you're done. Let me pull up the theorem once more because it's important, and um, I will call whatever you see here a standard form. Yeah. So S, 
every surface, every blah, 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 connected surface is determined by three numbers and you can obtain it by adding D's, P's, and T's to a sphere. Yeah, so this statement is just really, really good. And now we are, we are in a really good shape to check everything we want, essentially, because we have the complete classification. Uh, note that you can compute the Euler characteristic from here. You can compute the number of boundary cycles. You can decide whether it's orientable or not. Everything is just hidden in, in three numbers, the D, the P, and the T. And again, because it's always a bit confusing, because of this nonsense that the projective plane doesn't care for the difference between the torus and the Klein bottle, we always add this assumption that one of them is, this is just saying one of them is zero, okay? So either T is zero or P is zero. That's called a standard form of the surface. Yeah. Very, very important. So the main kind of uh, exercise we need to do from now on is whenever we see a surface, we need to put it in standard form. Uh, we need to identify D, P, and T, and then, then we are done. It doesn't matter how complicated it looks like, it doesn't matter, we just write down D, P, and T. And this is just a really, really good statement. Right? Just really, really exciting. Yeah, and I really call this a standard form. This just means in standard form you need to just, if it's orientable you put uh, t equals zero, uh, sorry, if it's non-orientable you put t equals zero and if it's orientable you put p equals zero and you count uh, the remaining uh, well, ingredients here. And that's the standard form. So in standard form p times t is always zero. And I need to make this decision, I say it again, because of this strange uh, projective plane doesn't see the difference between the torus and the Klein bottle. But that's all I need to do, and that's it. Three numbers determine absolutely everything. And that's, that's so fantastic. I'm, I'm a big fan, I'm a big fan. Yeah, it uniquely identifies the surface. It's orientable if and only if we can, we can put P equals zero. I, I think I said, said the converse, it's non-orientable if T is zero. Um, so it's orientable if and only if P is zero. It has D boundary cycles. The Euler characteristic is very easy to compute. Uh, that will happen in the tutorials, but remember this operation on the hash. You just write it down what happens, and the Euler characteristic is given by this very simple formula in the numbers D, P, and T. That's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. Do I have one more? Okay, and coming back to the non-connected one, so if you have a non-connected surface, the standard form is just bringing every connected component into a standard form. Yeah, I let the theorem on the, on the slide again because it's, it's really, really fantastic. Okay. In other words, well, it's not quite a corollary, but I will try to convince you that this is true. What we need to do in order to check what kind of surface we have, it's uniquely determined by the number of boundary cycles, whether it's orientable or not. So boundary cycles is counting three edges. Whether it's orientable or not is counting those, those pairs that go in the same direction. And it's Euler characteristic, we already know how to compute the Euler characteristic. Um, so why is the Euler characteristic also enough? Well, look at this formula. So I told you we already know D and we already know P, and then if we know either T or Euler characteristic is, is just the same. You can always just, if you want to bring something in standard form, three numbers you need to compute, and that's it. I mean, this is really fantastic. Just think about last week where we had absolutely had no clue what to do with surfaces and subsets. And this is a really, really simple uh, statement. And all of them are just essentially numbers. Orientability is an easy check, zero or one, essentially. Boundary circles, the D, uh, number of free edges, and the Euler characteristic is, of course, a number as well. Yeah. So I've done this before, and I already said that. Let me um, just show you what this theorem actually means, because I can, I can list now all surfaces for you, explicitly as surfaces and not as polygons. Um, so I just need to explain what those things are, so, and then we're done. Again, reiterating how strong this theorem actually is, I will list now all surfaces for you, um, all of them. Obviously, my list is finite, but you will get the point. Um, 
So this is just really, if you do it once, you poke one hole into your surface. If you do it twice, you poke two holes into your surface. If you poke three times, you poke three holes into your surface, uh, and so on. So if you do it six times, you put six holes into your surface. And my starting surface is always a sphere. So this is attaching holes to the sphere. I just take my soccer ball and pull, uh, poke holes into my soccer ball. Uh, for an arbitrary D, of course. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. So this is a, 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 a thing with D punctures. And essentially, the surfaces are, well, the sphere. And if you puncture a hole into the sphere, well, you get exactly this. So on the right-hand side, you see, of course, the sphere uh, is 2. And on the left-hand side, you see. And you just do this operation iterated again and again and again and again. So you puncture holes into the sphere. OK, so the next operation we need to understand, we understand the D operation. So let's look at the T operation. Um, well, here you go. Well, if you just do it once, you get a torus, I guess. Well, uh, let me draw, draw it like this, like a little handle on a huge sphere, because I would like to think of it as attaching something to a sphere. OK, if you do it twice, well, you actually get this picture. If you do it three times, well, you actually get this picture. I think you get the pattern. If you do it t times, you get a little sphere with a lot of those uh, handles. And that's why they're called handles. They're really just like handles on the sphere. I don't have a really good real world picture, but it's essentially this one. Right? So you have a lot of those um, handles for the sphere. Good. Not so bad, right? It's a, it's a two out of three operations. And it's just attaching little, poking holes or putting handles to the sphere. Well, oh, pretty good. And the last one is a bit complicated because the projective plane is a bit complicated. So uh, the best way I can do it, so this is, this is an, an, a, a, an attempt to draw uh, with Mathematica to illustrate uh, the projective plane in R3. But it's just really complicated. So what I will do is the following. I draw this little strange cup thing, a uh, cone thing, it's just a funny colored cone. It's just there somewhere a projective plane inside of my surface. But essentially what I do is I add those funny things to my sphere. Well, like exactly the same operation, like adding holes, adding uh, handles, or adding those funny symbols, because I can't illustrate them really nicely. But essentially it's just adding something to the sphere. Yeah, so. This is one of those pictures. So this is a standard form of a surface. There you go. A real world picture. I hope I haven't discounted. It should have eight punctures and uh, seven handles. This would be a projective plane type thing, attaching something to a sphere. It should have six punctures and nine of those funny colored cone type objects, which are just it's just the only way I can illustrate a projective plane. And of course, I leave it to your imagination to, to think of it as a projective plane. Here's another one. That's not quite in standard form, as you can see, because it contains a T and a P. So in standard form, it's always one of the two. So this here, if you now imagine those numbers going to being arbitrary, is a complete list of all possible surfaces. And that's a really cool, a cool statement in the end. And that's also where I stop. <laughs>